healthcare, social justice, COVID-19, and much more. Coming up next on Main Challenge. Hello, and welcome to Main Challenge. Our guest today is Betsy Sweet of Hallowell, a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the United States Senate. Thank you for joining us on our first show, Betsy. Thank you for having me, Chuck. I'm so excited. I'm excited about your show, and I'm really excited to be here. Well, it's good to have you. Uh, getting right into it, I, I call this question cornerstones, and I was wondering if you could tell us what issues you would say are the cornerstones of your campaign, and how will you address them once you're in office? Getting right to it. <laughs> um, Chuck, let me just say, I think that we are in trouble as a country. I think we have a lawless president and we have billionaires and millionaires and big money that's calling the shots in Washington and our government. And I think for most of us, we feel like our governmental systems, our political systems and our economic systems have betrayed us. And that's not just an interesting philosophical thing. It's resulted in things that have not helped us in our lives. So for me, the cornerstones of what we need to fight for are number one, we have got to get healthcare coverage for everybody. I support Medicare for all. I have been fighting for this for, as you know, probably almost three, four, almost four decades here in Maine, but to make sure that every person not just has access to healthcare, but actually has coverage. And if nothing, if we've learned nothing in the last two months from this pandemic, I think that is one thing that we can all see how broken our healthcare system is. So healthcare is number one. Number two is climate crisis. We, I support a Green New Deal, and I think we have got to make sure that uh, we have to do something rapidly and boldly. I think plans that take us out to 2045 or 2050 aren't going to do it. And I think the Green New Deal offers us an incredible opportunity to pair both dealing with the climate, but also with creating good paying, just jobs and, and revitalizing our economy, especially right here in Maine. And then I think the third thing, um, and there's many, and it's hard to say many, but just the third thing I think, and this is um, back to what I said beginning, I think all of these issues and the many that I care about and that I think many people in Maine care about are all undermined in our political process by money and politics. And I have spent the last 30 years in Maine and across this country trying to both connect the dots for people about how, the, how money influences our politics and to correct it. So much so that in the 90s, the mid 90s, I worked with a team of people here in Maine to create the first public financing system. And we're one of only two states that has that for our local races. But if we look at how much money is spent by, let's go back to healthcare, by insurance companies and by um, pharmaceutical companies to keep the broken system in place, then we see the, the connection. So when we, you know, when someone tells me that they can't get um, insulin and they can't afford their insulin, that's directly related to the amount of money that pharmaceutical companies give to politicians and line the pockets. So I think that's sort of the underpinning. I care a lot about free education and student debt and about domestic violence and about unfair, unfair taxation. But in terms of cornerstones, I would say those are the three things. Thank you. Um, would you go uh, outline a little bit about your previous experience in government? Um, how has that prepared you for serving in the United States Senate? And how do you convince Maine voters of your experience? And uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think that um, I call myself the sweet spot because I <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. But so I think I have a unique perspective. So I've been an advocate in the state of Maine for 37 years. I started out with the Maine Women's Lobby and the Maine Commission for Women, um, working on economic rights and um, reproductive choice. And then I started my own advocacy company. But the people who represented folks with mental health issues and domestic violence and sexual assault and low income folks and people who needed health care, we didn't have advocates that were there at two o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the morning behind closed doors when a lot of the decisions are made. But those organizations that are serving people and, and certainly those people themselves, we couldn't afford a, a full-time lobbyist. So I was like, what are we gonna do? And so I said, well, wait a minute. If everyone gave a little bit, then we could at least have somebody there who would make sure that the, our voices were at the table or to tell us when to be there. And so that's how I started my advocacy group called Moose Ridge Associates. So again, so for 37 years, I have been writing legislation, 
passing legislation. Um, I've worked on every single budget that has come down the pike for the last 37 years. Um, I have worked on helping to train new legislators on how to understand the budget, how to write legislation, as well as people, citizens and advocates and people who are uh, consumers of services that are funded by Maine, how to be involved. And so again, I know how the process works. I have worked it very successfully, I would say, but I haven't had to be part of the broken system. You know, that system that requires that big money, that requires corporate money to get you elected, to get you where you are, especially if you're in leadership. And so I think it's this, you know, we need, I think we want a fresh perspective. We want, if you will, an outsider perspective, not same old, same old politicians, but we also want someone who need, has some experience because we know what happens, or we're seeing at the, <laughs> the presidential level right now, what happens when you have someone with no experience in government. And so I think it is, I think I have this incredibly unique and important perspective that um, is sort of the best of both worlds. Uh, thank you. I, I'm sure that you are sick by now, uh, but not everybody has really embraced the fact that our primary election has been moved from, from what was June 9th. Now the primary is July 14th, Tuesday, July 14th. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how you see the primary working out on this new date of July 14th. And yeah. do you feel that voting by mail is a safe and workable option for Maine voters? Yeah, so I think it was a really smart decision. You know, this is unprecedented, right? We don't, we don't, there's no rule book on how to do this. So I think that June 9th, definitely, uh, we knew that voting in person would be out of the question. And also that the time required to get some sort of uh, enhanced system of voting by mail or absentee voting was didn't have enough time. So I think it was a good decision that the governor made. Um, that said, I think it's unusual. So I think we have two things working against us. One is that we had the presidential primary for the first time in 20 or 30 years where people went to the polls in March for the presidential primary. So many people are feeling like primary, we already did that, you know, we're, we're done. So, so I think we have to remind people that there is another primary. And I think, um, as I understand it there, and you know, again, things are changing, but right now there will be options. You can, you can order your, you can go online and get your absentee ballot application right now. And then you can get your absentee ballot and sign it in and you're done. There will be some in-person voting options on July 14th. Um, we don't know exactly what that's gonna look like or how uh, accessible or widespread that's gonna be, but I can assure you um, that we will be calling you and reminding you and letting you know that there is in fact a primary on July 14th. Um, and again, ordinarily I'd say that's a terrible time because Mainers are in the midst of summer and everybody, all our visitors are here, but who knows, we may actually have a lot of time on our hands. <laughs> I, I always enjoyed the social aspect of voting. I've lived in the same small town for 40 years and it's a, it's a social event. And I always enjoy, even when I wasn't running for office, I enjoyed going to the polls and actually seeing people and saying hi. Uh, I'm not gonna do that this year. I have a lot of faith in our Secretary of State's office and the Depart Bureau of Elections to be able to conduct the election correctly, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to miss the social aspect of small town voting. Um, speaking of small towns, the state, our state is divided into two congressional districts. And I'm wondering, and they're definitely different, uh, have different philosophical bents to them. Um, I would expect that, that as a progressive, you would do well in the first district. How do you think you'll do in the second district and why? Yeah, I think I'll do great in the second district um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think that the philosophical, I think the way people talk about the divide in this country and in Maine of uh, liberal and conservative and right and left and in Maine, north and south, you know, I've crisscrossed this state for two years running for governor and, and until we got shut down, I had 35 town halls and was every corner of Maine in the Senate race. And I don't find that, Chuck. I don't find the divide falls out that way. To me, what I find is that the divide is really between us and a lot of really shared values in Maine that we share commonly across political spectrums. Um, and it's really divide between us and the political establishment that doesn't either listen to us or take care of us. And so when I spent, I spent a lot of time in the second district and um, of the towns I won in my governor's race, the vast majority of the towns I won were in the second district. Um, and it's people, you know, I haven't met anybody in the state, in North or South, who doesn't believe that if you are sick, you should be able to go to a doctor and get care, or that you should get, go bankrupt doing it. 
And the thing that I find, the difference, the big difference is that people that I speak to, the further away, are, further away you are from Augusta, the less they believe that anyone understands or cares about their lives. Fishing Derby in Saint Agat and at the Long Lake Fishing Derby, it was awesome. There was like 1,400 people there. And I was actually going ice shack to ice shack, talking to people, sitting down and having a little cinnamon whiskey and <laughs> trying to catch a fish and you know, talking to people. And you know what I found was something I find all over, which is people are mad. And as I said, I think in the beginning, people feel like the economic system and the political system has betrayed them. And they want someone who's gonna listen, who's gonna be there, like they were shocked that I was there and spending time there, but also someone who understands and has lived their experience. You know, my grandpa lobster, um, and I grew up on the back of lobster boats and back of trucks. And I think understanding and living as a single mom with three kids, you know, for 20, almost 20 years, you know, I think I have a, capacity to not only understand, but to have a lot of shared experiences with people. So I don't think the divide is what the media and what a lot of political pundits want us to have. And I don't find it. So I'm, I'm excited. I am very excited about my chances in the second district. Um, again, I've spent a lot of time up there. And um, I, you know, I think that we, we have a lot of support in the second district. So I feel really good about that. And I also, I just also want to say, you know, to the understanding part, you know, I talked to this great, I was in the diner in Millinocket and uh, talking to these guys sitting at breakfast and um, they, uh, they we, we joined them. And he said, Betsy, you know what? He said, I don't, I'm not worried about my kid, you know, moving to Boston. I'm not even worried that my kid won't have a job. I'm worried that my kid is going to have three jobs. Right now he's working in the nursing home, at the convenience store and plowing snow in the winter just to make enough money to pay the taxes on this house, my little house that you know, he's gonna inherit and the little camp we have. You know, and he said, you know, that's what I'm worried about. And so I think you know, when we talk and we, if we understand and talk about those things and actually get and actually work on solutions to those problems, I think that you know, that's what people are waiting for and that's what they're looking for. Uh, briefly, as, as you talk to people, do you hear from voters? I, I know how the candidates feel, and it's, it, it, it's easy to understand how the candidates feel, but do you feel that voters also feel that elections are too costly? Oh, 100%. You know, I mean, I think that, you know, I think that there's polling about like 97% of Americans, right, believe that uh, there's too much, that money in politics is a problem. The problem is about 90% believe there's nothing we can do about it. You know, look at this. I mean, I, as I said, it, this has been a lifelong passion of mine. You know, back in 1994, in the Maine State Legislature, a bunch of us got together and were horrified that a state Senate race cost $6,000 to run. <laughs> now that seems like peanuts. But, um, but, you know, and so we got together and wrote, I did the research for the Clean Elections Act, and I said, you know, no one's ever going to, legislators aren't going to do anything about this until we actually... The money was raised and the vote changed. So we, unfortunately, we found those cases and not just one. And so we, we wrote a report called Elections or Auctions. And I think we are at that stage right now. Is are we holding elections or are we holding auctions? And you know, the sad part is in auctions, you and I and the people I'm talking to, we're not the highest bidders. And so you know, when people are talking about this race, um, the Susan Collins race, the people in Washington, again, the pundits are saying that this race is going to cost between 100 and 150 million dollars, Chuck. And I mean, this is a state with a million people. My opponent in this primary has already spent almost 10 million dollars. And I think we're going to have 100,000 people vote in this race. Like, what is that? So it does a lot of things. You know, it's not just that it's, a, you know, just think how in this pandemic, what we could do with 150 million dollars that would actually help Mainers. But I think the other thing is that it really, it really affects what issues get brought up or don't get brought up and who legislators talk to and how they spend their time. So people who are elected to Congress are spending their time raising money and, and hobnobbing with wealthy people who can donate instead of figuring out, okay, how the hell are we gonna get healthcare? What are we gonna, not the if, but how, you know, how are we gonna create green new jobs? And, you know, I mean, and so, so it's got a lot of tentacles. That problem has a lot of tentacles. Right. Um, you're, you're making great transitions for, you're doing my job for me. And I <laughs> um, is Maine striking a good balance in addressing the challenge of the, the COVID-19 coronavirus 
And uh, what would you differently do differently if you were leading the uh, the charge against it? You know, I think um, I think certainly Governor Mills and um, Dr. Shaw have done a really good job. I mean, it's such a, you know again, there's no playbook for this. We don't have any idea, and so I think you know keeping people safe and you know and trying to figure out how to keep the economy going and you know helping people I think you know on the state level I think we're working really hard and everyone's doing a really good job trying to make that work you know I know we've had trouble a lot of people and my heart goes out to you um, trying to get unemployment insurance and sole proprietors and it's taking too long and I understand that my problem is at the national level you know we are so first of all we're having a conversation we're having big conversations about the value of a human life versus money and you know, you hear some extraordinary things coming out of people's mouths about, well, you know, some people are gonna have to die. You know, like, I mean, you know, we have to open up the economy. And I think that there's a, a path forward for that, but it's not that. But if we look at the bailout, uh, you know, if we look at how much money, you know, when we did the first bailout of $2.5 trillion, you know, 400 billion of that went to people through unemployment and help, you know, and that's a good thing. And we saw the horror stories that, you know, companies that are very wealthy, universities like Harvard that have billions of dollars in um, endowments, were getting money. And my friends, my neighbors, your neighbors, people I'm talking to who can't, don't have two months of cash on hand to make through, were getting nothing. And that is, again, 100% attributable to the lobbyists writing the bills, to people. And, you know, there was all kinds of things that I think we don't even know yet about um, there was a huge tax break for real estate developers snuck in this thing, you know, and again, there's a lot of specifics that I think, but I think it also adds to people's cynicism about Washington, you know, and I, so I think um, there's a huge problem. I also think the lack of a national response and a coordinated response to get pe um, professional personal protection equipment, ventilators, you know, there was a way to do this and triage this at a national level that could have saved a lot of lives, that could have protected a lot of people that didn't happen. I think that the president abdicated his responsibility, then in many cases made it worse. Um, and there was no national coordinated strategy. And I think it's led to a lot of loss of life. So on that level, I think we, uh, we should be furious and we should be demanding change and certainly demanding change in 2020. Oh, thanks. But by January, when you're sworn in, uh, more than $4 trillion will have been spent on the economic recovery. How will Senator Sweet meet the challenges of creating a budget with deficits of that size? You know, I think the issue of deficits and the issue of uh, resources in, Maine, uh, in this country is really got, has really gotten skewed. First of all, Every time we try and do something that's for people, for you and me and our friends and neighbors, like healthcare or like um, creating jobs or like paying a livable wage or like doing paid sick leave or paid family medical leave, no money, can't do it. But whenever we need to bail out Wall Street or we need to create a tax cut you know, for the richest corporations and the richest people, all of a sudden that money is no problem. So I don't think it's so much of a, uh, I think, the issue is not the amount of resources, Chuck, I think it's how we spend it. And I think that the priorities have been completely away from American people, away from Mainers, away from us regular middle-class working families, um, low-income folks, and totally on behalf of the corporations. So the first thing that I wanna do is pull the curtain back and tell the truth about where this money is going. For example, one of my favorite examples, or not favorite, one of the worst examples, but Paying, um, are paying, uh, oops, can you hear me? Uh, you, you dropped out for a second, but sorry. I can hear you Okay, now. sorry. Um, so we are, our tax dollars are sub tune of $20 billion a year. So $20 billion we are giving to the richest corporations in the world to do something that's killing us and killing the environment, right? So that's just one example. We have others, you know, we have the, certainly the tax cuts and we have the, you know, and the fact that we've got Amazon and General Dynamics and Duke Energy, these huge corporations that are making billions of dollars in profit who are spending, z who are paying zero in taxes, while you and I are spending, make, you know, paying between 20 and 30% of our, what our hard earned money, like that's not right. And when we correct that, 
the deficit conversation and the resource conversation changes completely. So I think we have to pull the curtain back, do some truth telling and really say, okay, what are we really dealing with here? Because this idea, and you know, you know, you're in the legislature, you know, the whole idea of working on budgets and sifting through budget documents, it's hard. And that's one of the things I think I bring as to Senator Sweet to this is I know how to read those budgets. I know how to look for where the, where the bones are buried. You know, I know how to find those pockets that are just sort of get shuffled under and we're not supposed to know about it or think about it. And in fact, there's money there. And so I think the deficit conversation needs to pivot to a completely different conversation about priorities. Well, that's, that's, that's very interesting. I'm also concerned, talking about big problems, um, how we get our country back on track uh, by addressing the, the climate crisis. Mm. You know, if we don't deal with this, <laughs> right, all the rest of the problems don't matter, right? And so I think, um, I think one of the things that's, so, that's possible, first of all, I think we have to make this, we have to define it differently instead of just saying, oh, it's a crisis and, you know, it's too bad, we have to look at it as a national security threat, you know, because our security is threatened. And I think that there's a lot of evidence that the COVID um, crisis and even the, you know, the giant bees that are landing, the killer bees that are here or whatever, they're all related to climate. And yeah, and, and you know, and, my, and as I said, I, my grandpa was a lobsterman. And so, you know, in Maine, we live the climate crisis, right? Not just because we care about earth and, you know, and the clean environment, but our lobster resources, our fisheries, our woods, our farmers, our agriculture, we live it and it's the backbone of our economy as well as part of our heart and soul. So I think we have to address it as a crisis and we have to put the same amount of energy and resources as we do to the pandemic we're going through, right? Imagine, I've had young people say to me, Betsy, imagine if we treated the climate crisis like we're treating this pandemic. Imagine if we talk every day, we got, Oh, this is how many billions tons of ice melted today. This is how much the sea level rose today. This is how many people died from climate related illness and asthma. This is how many climate refugees there are now because they can't live in places that are too hot. You know, this is the, you know, this is what's happening and this is what's happening in the environment in the Antarctic when we have 70 degree days and 65 degree days. So I think that one of the things again is for us to laser focus on this issue. And we see that when we do that, we can. The other thing that I think is so promising is that for years, when I've been doing environmental activism for a long time, and, and I, you know, I think even when as you were a legislator, you know, the economy and the environment were like this, like either you were for economic development or you were for the environment, but they were like this. Now, it's just the opposite. We can create an economy, especially right here in Maine, that is good for the economy and is good for the environment. I think Maine could be the epicenter of creating green energy between the ocean and the sun and the wind. And if we put it on a public grid, we could export it, not just make ourselves fossil fuel free, but we could export it to the rest of New England. And we could create good jobs, have an inflow of population and young people and you know, technologically brilliant people here who are already here and use our smarts. So I think it's both a crisis, but it's an incredible opportunity. And I think this is the first time in history that that's been true. So I'm very excited to get going on that. Now, one other thing I will say about this is the other big answer to climate crisis is regenerative agriculture and the way we do our farming practices. And there, you know, in no-till agriculture and mob grazing of animals and, you know, there's, it's, I only know enough to be dangerous, but the, the soil can sequester a lot of that carbon. And we have young farmers new farmers, organic farmers in Maine who are on the cutting edge. And Shelly Bingry has been on the cutting edge of this in Congress. And I can't wait to go to Washington and help her out on the Senate side. I know Angus has been doing some as well. But I think, I think this is, again, it's a crisis and we should, uh, we should mobilize ourselves and resources that way. But man, I think we have some incredible opportunities to do something good. Well, that's incredible. I, I have figured out that we need more than 27 minutes to cover all the, uh, the <laughs> before you, but it's been very interesting to, uh, to listen to your answers and to hear your energy, feel your energy and, uh, and your sense of leadership, which I really appreciate and respect. Um, one more question, if you, and this has to be quick, but if you're successful in the July 14th primary, July 14th, did I say July 14th? 14th, July 14th. <laughs> if you're successful in the July 14th primary, uh, how will you beat Senator Collins? 
you know, I'm not so interested in defeating being against Senator Collins. I'm much more interested in being for the people of Maine. And I think she has left us. And I think we need someone in Washington who is on our side. And I think as we talk about these issues, just like we have here today, and we say this is what, this is what it looks like when you have a senator on your side, I think people are going to come um, pretty easily. And so I'm very excited. I can't wait to have policy debates um, and, you know, and talk about what this is like. And again, I'm not interested in saying what's not good and how bad the other person is. I want to know and I want to talk about what's, what, we are, what we're for and what we're gonna to do to move Maine forward. That's how I've spent my life, and that's what I wanna do in the US Senate. Well, thank you so much, Betsy Sweet. It's been a very interesting half an hour, and I hope we can get you back uh, in another future show. Uh, but thank you so much for being a part of Maine Challenge this week, and good luck to you in your coming two elections. Thank you, Chuck, so much. Thanks for having me, and anybody who wants to go to BetsySweet.com, and we would love to have you join us. Join us next Sunday at 10, 2, or 6 for another episode of Main Challenge, a presentation of Lincoln County Indivisible. Show your support for Main Challenge and LCTV's programming. We're all about community. Please go to lctv.org to make a contribution. Your support makes us stronger together.